guys, welcome to episode number 20 of the Chris and Katie show. That is a milestone, Katie. Number 20. 2-0. That's nuts. That's nuts. Since it is number 2-0, I decided we would um, we would invite some 5-0 on the on the on the show tonight. <laughs> <laughs> See what I did there? Just out of nowhere. <laughs> Guys, we That's got... why you were laughing. I was like, <laughs> when you said two o, I was that? like, oh funny. my god, here we go already. Uh, we've got my good friend Kelly, aka Fubar MP, all the way from um, Iowa. He is a deputy sheriff, and he's going to be helping us with our main event topic this week, uh, which is going to be bad cops versus good cops. What is a good cop? What is a bad cop? Is systemic racism real in this country when it comes to police? Should we defund police? Should we train police better? All of those things are going to come up in our main event topic tonight. Fubar is going to give his expert opinion on a lot of that stuff. Uh, Fubar, give us a little bit of background on on what you do for a living and how long you've been doing it and all that stuff. Yeah, so born and raised in Iowa, and uh, after school I got into the Army. I was uh, actually 31 Bravo in the Army as military police. And then after I got out of the Army, I thought, why not be a cop? So I got in, uh, worked a small town uh, police job for a little bit, and then got on with the sheriff's department. So I've been copping for almost ten and a half years, if you count just the private side or public side. So this is essentially a lifetime commitment for you, not just with military, but law and order in general has kind of been your your life, really, right? Yeah. So uh, I've. Uh, been on the fire department also and been with the military and then in the police sector and stuff and yeah i love it yeah and i'm really excited to have you on today this uh just so we're clear this was actually his idea this is a great idea um of a, of a subject that really touches all of us that we're going to talk about uh later in the show i hope you guys will stay with us for that um, but let's catch up with katie katie how's your week been it's been good um same shit, different week. I wish I, could, I wish I could say the same. So, what's today? Monday. So, I guess it was Saturday. It was Friday or Saturday. I was making lunch. Got through my chores. And I uh, fed, fed and watered the dogs. Went to grab some lunch from the fridge. And I was just going to put it in the microwave. And I grabbed the, the stuff from the fridge. Turned to go towards the microwave. And I got the most intense pain in the center of my chest that I've ever felt in my life. Literally thought I was having a heart attack because, again, my dad had five or six heart attacks as I was growing up, so it's always been a fear of mine. And this was, I mean, I've had kidney stones before. This was by far the worst pain I've ever had. And so um, I, I literally went from feeling fine to all of a sudden I'm literally like, like stuck to a chair I couldn't breathe. My, uh, I was sweating, like just drip, dripping off of me. So, um, unfortunately, I was actually the only one in the house at the time. Everybody else was hanging out outside, and my wife and son were at the cell phone store thinking about getting, you know, a new cell phone. So, one of my fears is also like as many people who live near me. I'm always feeling pretty good. Like if something happens, I'll, I'll be taken care of. Somebody will be able to call. It just so happened this was one of those times where I was isolated. Um, so that terrified me almost immediately. And so I managed to get a text off into our group chat, just like, you know, intense pain. Please, you know, send help, etc. Got some aspirin in me, called an ambulance. So they took me to the hospital. Um, and, and I've had a lot of people asking about this since then. But I wanted to wait until the, to the live show tonight so that way I wouldn't have to, like, keep repeating it, you know. But... Uh, so we get to the hospital and they run all the tests, EKGs and things like that. Now they hit me with a couple of uh, uh, doses of nitroglycerin on the ride to the ER, which kind of caused the pain to subside some. Kind of turned it from like a 10 to like maybe a 3 or a 4. And um, anyway, ultimately they, they ran all these tests. I did not have a heart attack, thank God. Um, but I have been diagnosed with something called pleurisy. Um, which apparently is a uh, yet another lung issue that I'm going to have to deal with um, possibly the rest of my life. But basically it was center of the chest and it has something to do with inflammation 
um, around the lung wall or something like that. And it could have been exasperated by me going to karaoke the other night in a place where they still allow smoking. Um, that could have caused it. But anyway, I'm fine. Still in a little bit of pain. Not supposed to be doing anything except rest. But, you know, the show must go on. A parent fucking Lee, what the hell? I feel pretty good though. Um, like I said, I don't know why it stopped. Like it's not like they just gave me medicine to make it better. Um, they just yeah. they gave me nitro. They gave me a little bit of Toradol on the way out of the ER. Um, but I felt pretty good since then. Just out of nowhere, it good. literally felt like a heart attack. It was absolutely terrifying. I'll I'll, I'll just say that like. So I don't know how much of it from there, from the pain onward, was just me, like, panicking, you know, and um, just filled with anxiety. Mm -mm. I don't know what it was, but yeah. but anyway, Dog. we are here, and we're, um, we're at episode 20, and we're going to get into fun stuff. We have a, a couple of really cool um, music-related stories today, um, possibly some foreshadowing of the Oasis reunion was performed by Jane's Addiction this week. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about the VMAs a little bit later. Something that John Bon Jovi did that was absolutely incredible that I'm hoping I can uh, not only share the story, but perhaps show you guys some incredible, incredible video um, from John Bon Jovi. And, of course, the main event topic that we talked about earlier, we're still going to have our uh, Katie's Bitch Fit, our Weird But True News. Um, Fubar is going to play our Game of the Week in, in a little while. But first, we're going to do our top five segment, and our top five segment this week is going to be our favorite top five summer songs. Um, this one was requested by my wife, Unexpected Acorn, and the rules of this are the song must have the word summer in the title of the song. So it can't just be a summer song that you enjoy because it's summer related. It actually has to have the word in the title. And so we're going to go um, Katie, Fubar, and then me. Um, five, four, three, two, one. Katie, you get to go first. What is your number five mm -hmm. summer song? So these are all songs that popped into my brain as soon as I thought of summer. So this is like maybe not the best picks, but here we are. Okay. Uh, my number five is Summer by Calvin Harris. Did like pop song like anyway always get hyped to it that came out when i i was still listening to like pop music like when i was younger i mean I you're still know. listening when to I'm pop into... music i would say right? well that's a little dip that like two th when did that come out like 2014 2015 it's, it's been a minute like yeah it has definitely been a minute yeah that's a different kind of pop back then <laughs> i feel like yeah. Yo, Bacon right. Man 666, yeah. welcome in, man. Thanks for coming in, checking out the Chris and Katie show. Um, Fubar, what is your number five uh, summer song? Well, my number five summer song is some dubstep, and we're going to go with The Summer Dies by Deadmau. Let's go. Man, this is going to be awesome, bro. Like, we're so different musically, <laughs> I think. Mine are all going to be, like, from, you know, 14 centuries ago and shit. Like, you know, <laughs> the summer retreat by Beethoven. No, it's not going to be that old. <laughs> so uh, I love that. So my number five um, is Cruel Summer by Banana Rama, And, of course, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Taylor Swift also covered that song. Yes, uh, so she did. It would, be, it would be a Banana Rama slash Taylor Swift. Cruel Summer is my number five. Uh, Katie, what was your number five again? Summer by Calvin Harris. Do you know what song I'm talking about? Yes, I just need to try to write these down and remember. And yours it's, again, Fubo? It's a anthem. And the Summer Dies by Dead Mel. Nice. Okay. All right, Katie, what is your number four? My number four is some Lana Del Rey Summertime Sadness. I love Lana Del should. Rey. I've heard so many people say, you know, like, they don't like her because she's just in everybody's face all the time. But that's usually how you can tell when somebody's really good, right? Like, you hear about them all yeah. the time. Yeah. What's your number four, Fubar? 
Uh, my number four is pretty funny because I don't think that they say summer a single time in the song, but the name of the song is My Own Summer by Deftones. <laughs> Let's go. I knew where you were going with it as soon as you said that because, yeah, I don't think they do say the summer at all in that song. <laughs> yep. I'm pretty sure you're right. <laughs> Um, my number four is The Boys of Summer by Don Henley. Um, I'm just a huge baseball fan, and that's always kind of been an anthem of mine um, to let me know when baseball season was starting, I guess. Um, but, yeah, The Boys of Summer. And plus, Don Henley is uh, uh, from East Texas as well, where we live at. So, Always. Katie, uh, what is your number three? So my number three um – more than likely nobody's gonna know but it's one of my it was the first song that popped in my head right here okay and it is my good friend doug allen it is one of his songs and it's called summer me and i i love the song i love the song and it had to be on the list i don't care if nobody knows it everybody go check it out summer me by doug allen that's absolutely so. awesome no you should absolutely shine lights on your friends and and Take that opportunity every week if you can, possibly, on this show. Fubar, what is your number I three? Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Katie. I was going to say, I genuinely love the song. It's not just because it's my friend either. Like, I think it's, like, a really good song. Isn't it hard to convince people? Like, when you know somebody, and then you're like, oh, I really love them. But people are always like, yeah, but you know them. Of course you love them. Yeah. But isn't it hard yeah, to no, convince them? Like, like no, nah, even if I didn't know them, I would still love this song. Yeah, I listen to that song. I, like, love it. There's a difference, mm -hmm. you know. There's I agree, yeah. And, you're, like, just trying to convince people, like, you should really check them out. Like, it's not just because I'm saying it. It's because you really it's, should it's check them out. It's not just me trying to promote. Right, exactly. Fubar, what's your number three? My number three is going to show how much a variety of music I listen to. So my number three is Summertime Blues by Alan Jackson. I love that. I love that a lot. Um, because it wasn't originally a, 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 an Alan Jackson song. I think it was uh, originally done by Eddie Cochran back in the 60s. Um, but yeah, I loved Alan Jackson's version of it too. Um, I feel like back in the 90s, uh, when Alan Jackson released that song, there was a lot of that happening where people would, a lot of country artists would try to take like a rockabilly song or, or a doo wop type song from the 50s and 60s, try to countrify it and then put it out. And it, it, for some reason in the late 80s and mid 90s, that was a, that was a big thing in country music. And But I think Alan Jackson had the biggest hit out of all of those ones that, that they were doing back mm -hmm. in those days. Uh, my number three is going to be Summertime by DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, a.k.a. Will Smith. Um, I'm sorry, every time I hear that song, it does not leave my head for literally weeks. And I hate it. Like, right now, I'm literally hearing the song in my mind, and I'm already hating myself. God dang it. What's <laughs> Katie, what is your number two? So my number two is Blood Red Summer by Coheed and Cambria. I have actually talked about them a lot within these past few episodes, which is pretty funny. Um, but yeah, Blood Red Summer by Coheed. I saw that on the list of uh, songs with Summer in the title, and I was like, I guarantee you Katie has that in her top five. Uh, <laughs> and I even took a listen to it. I like the song. It's pretty good. Uh, Fubar, well, what's you. your number two? Uh, so this will be your air, uh, Boston, but Summer Breeze by Seals and Croft. Oh, you think that's my era? Okay, then. Right. <laughs> wow. Fubar is trying to fight over here. No, I, I wasn't a big <laughs> Seals and Crofts fan, actually. But, yeah, they mm. are probably from my era, mid-'80s, I suppose. Um, That song, I don't know, man. It was, like, it was too far on the easy listening side for me, like soft rock or whatever they called it back then. Um, my number two is Summer Nights by John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John from the movie Grease, of course. Um, just because the, I, I feel like somebody should release a new version of that song with, like, new technology. You know, like, you know, tell me more, tell me more. Did he send you pictures on Snapchat? You know, like, stuff like that. Just change it up. <laughs> All right, our number one summer songs... Katie Lynn, what is your number one? Well, um, apparently fell a little flat for some people, but uh, mine is the one that never says summer, uh, My Own Summer by Deftones. That is my number one. <laughs> nice. Um, 
I that's the first thing that came into mind was uh, shove it, and I was like, that doesn't even say summer in it. <laughs> that was the, <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. But yeah, that's my number one. So. Very nice. I love that. Very very um very eclectic list of five there. Calvin Harris, Lana Del Rey, Doug Allen. Coheed and Cambria and Deftones. Very interesting. Fubar, what is your number one summer related song or summer in the title song, rather? It's a catchy song that you can't just help but jam, but All Summer Long by Kid Rock. Okay. I agree. That's a very catchy song. I feel like that was done before by somebody, too, but perhaps not. I don't know. But yeah, that was a very, a very catchy song when it came out for sure. Um, I can hear mm -hmm. it playing right now in my mind as well. My number one is my number one is "Summer of '69." Brian Adams. Um, summer of '69. Yeah, see, like one of the most classic summer songs of all time, I feel. But yeah, um, if you that, are, if uh, almost, go ahead, Katie. That almost feels like a rape roll at this point. <laughs> summer of '69. <laughs> Fubar likes the freaky stuff. Fubar is going in. Yes, he is absolutely. <laughs> going in hard i love it so there are our top five summer songs guys if you're watching on twitch let me know what your top five are if even if uh let us know whose list is the best mine foobar or katie um and if you're watching on um youtube or spotify later on comment below your favorite five summer songs also give us some ideas for future top five segments um, I could definitely use some of those as well. Um, in the meantime, Katie, are you ready for your bitch fit? Oh, <laughs> yeah. She's like, no, I am not. So I'm going to point at you when you are all set. Are you ready? Oh, wait, 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 wait. I got to pull up my dad jokes. Uh-oh, no, more dad jokes. <laughs> Let's go. My joke today was hilarious. I don't know if you guys saw it. It was one of my favorites. I didn't. It was great. Oh, my God. It took us like 10 minutes to film it. We had to keep doing it over and over again to make it, <laughs> to make it believable. Anyway. All right. Here we go, Katie. You ready? Here yes. we go. Let me see here. Hello. Okay. Um, this is my time to shine. Fuck them. Oh, fuck them. Sorry. Um, we have our guest. Okay. Um, hi, Katie's bitch fit dad jokes. So I made a paper airplane, but it just hovered in one spot like a helicopter. Then I remembered that it was stationary. What do you call a soldier with no legs? I love this fucking one. This one's hilarious. Army. Oh, <laughs> I just imagine calling it. A mofo army. That's hilarious. <laughs> I haven't spoken to my wife in four years. I thought it would be rude to interrupt her. Honestly, it's kind of sexist. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's not funny. Why is love like a fart? If you have to force it, it's probably shit. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Okay, okay, okay. Done with that bullshit. Okay. <laughs> so last week, I bitched about church. Um, <laughs> for people that didn't watch last week, um, my sweet little student that I love so very much and her family wanted me to play guitar for her at church while she sang a couple songs. Um, super sweet. I was like, absolutely, I will do it. But man, church. Um, and they had us get there at 8.30, no, 8.15 in the morning, Sunday morning. And we didn't go on stage until 9.45. And we did two songs. And then I had to sit there till 1045. And then it was done. I'm like, God, I signed up on my half day. And then they took me out to eat, which was very sweet. But I was like, man, there goes half of my day. And then I had to work at the factory. 
get shit. It's actually really chill. It was a. Uh, I'm just surprised you didn't burst uh, into flames. Shut the fuck up. I know. I know. Um, and it was like all geriatrics too. There was no one young at all, like at all, anywhere close. Uh, <laughs> and they were all really sweet. None of them looked at me weird, which I thought was new. Um, <laughs> I thought it was new. It was great. Um, it was really great. It wasn't that bad. I drank some shitty Folgers coffee and uh, had a pig in a blanket, and it made it better. But um, they took me out to eat afterwards, which was nice, um, very nice. And then I worked at the factory. Sundays are always ass. Like, they're supposed to be, like, the chill days. Sundays and Mondays are my ass days. <laughs> no offense. <laughs> and it's not because of you. It's not because of you, boss. And I love you so much. Mondays are great because of you. But this is at the end of my day. I have to get to you first. Anyway. I just shit all over the whole show. Okay. Moving on from church. Um, yep. No more Folgers sponsorship. Thanks for that, Katie. <laughs> oh, how does it go? Uh, isn't it like Folgers in your cup or some shit? I don't think it's shitty Folgers coffee. I know that much. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. Here's the thing. It's not bad, but I was drinking black coffee. So it was bad. <laughs> So these commercials that we do, that like if we ever do get a chance, right? We don't we don't get to explain them afterwards, Katie. We have to get it right the first time. It's only good with Kramer. <laughs> oh. Put it on the packaging. It's only good with Kramer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Are you cutting me off? No, the, this is your bitch fit, not okay. mine. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I'm like, am I taking up too much? I don't know how long I've been talking. I talked for a long time once you get me started. Okay, uh, that's the update on the church. Uh, Snow Patrol. I talked about their singles that they released. I don't know if that was last week or the week before. They released the whole album, and I didn't listen to the whole thing. I listened to about half of it um, before I had to, you know, go to work. <laughs> um, and it just kind of fell flat. Like, obviously, you know, you release your strongest songs as singles or whatever before the album, blah, 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 blah. But it was just, like, night and day difference. It was, like, like some of them, like, I got behind for a second, and then I was like, now it just went to shit. I don't know. I got to go listen to the other half before I can give a good, like, commentary on it. But I'll let y'all know next week on that. But that's an update. It's shit. Um, Ginger, uh, they really... <laughs> They released a new song, and it's not new. It, the re well, I say it's not new. It's six days old, and that's old to me. The fact that I found it six days late is pretty damn depressing, um, considering you're supposed to be my favorite band. Um, but it's called Rogue, and it's badass. Boston, you should check it out, because now I made you like Ginger. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, that's enough with the music little snippets I want to throw in there. I quit Marcos today. Fuck pizza. Um, we ain't doing that shit no more. Um, but, yeah, basically, um, okay, I can't say anything on the small chance that somebody sees this, but I don't like, uh, shit being talked about me <laughs> especially bullshit um especially by um said people in church um so uno numero uno um uh, two uh they weren't giving me any shifts really so i was getting like my paycheck for two weeks obviously i'm a driver so like i get a lot of tips and we don't, we don't get paid a lot hourly i got a 60 dollar check for two weeks and i was like nope <laughs> done <laughs> fuck that Fuck that. So, and then I was like, that I came to that conclusion. That was Friday. And then Saturday, I did the wedding makeup, right? All that shit. And Saturday, I was completely busy. Sunday, obviously, too. And I decided yesterday that I was going to wait and see what the schedule was for this week because maybe. Because I've been busy and I'm like, okay, I can't do this day this week. And maybe she just got confused for a couple weeks or a few weeks or some shit 
Well, no, this week was just as bad as the past two or three weeks. So I was like, fuck it, I'm done. Texted her, done. She never texted me back, so. I'm Gucci. I'm done with my bitch fit. No more bitch fit? Oh, no. All right, let's see what we got to do here to make this better. All right, there we go. And then we can do that, that really is a bit straight up. I love Katie's bitch fit. I got a corner every week. It's always so much fun to hear what's in your head. Um, try to figure out. <laughs> Not a lot, but very interesting, all of it at least. It is very interesting. Your Your barefoot stuff from last week was amazing. When I listened to it back, I was like, oh my god, bro. Like, I can't wait to title this video. It's just going to be bri uh, Barefoot Bridesmaids. Like, it just, it fits so, like, you know what I mean? Like, it just sounded great. I um, saw my sister uh, Saturday, and she didn't say not one fucking word about it. <laughs> that means they're not watching your show, which means you need to give them shit. No. Well, no, because we are in a group chat, and I was on our group chat, like, listen here, bitch, kind of <laughs> shit, and she never said anything, and then I finally saw her Saturday, and she still didn't say shit, so. We need to talk about group chats later on, like, in a future episode, because <laughs> I think we all have them, right? Like, we all have our family group chats that are always freaking filled yes. with memes and gifts and shit, you know? Probably. Oh my God. Oh, we can sure. have a segment of shit we pull from family group chats. That would be amazing. We should do that one week. <laughs> Absolutely. So but speaking of fun, we are going to do the game of the week. And um, as you guys may know, Katie and I will um, rotate who does the game. But anytime we have a special guest, like we have Fubar here tonight, the special guest always does the game. That's part of the, pr the prerequisite of being on the show. You have to agree to do the game. So Fubar uh, reached out to me to be a guest on the show, knowing full well that he was going to have to do the game. So um, I, I got to give him a lot of credit uh, for that. But So here's what I'm going to try to do. I have not tried this with four people yet. So let's see if this works out. We're going to do this, and then this, and then this. And now um, hopefully everybody can see that, at least part of it. So I'm going to spin the wheel, and whatever it comes up on is the game that Fubar will have to play. Then we will spin the wheel a second time for the topic that he's going to have to talk about. So here is the game. So Fubar will be the world's greatest expert. Uh oh. And the question is, what is he going to be the world's greatest expert of? Um, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of bad... Boy bands, dinosaurs. Why are these all back? Get out of here. I've deleted <laughs> you guys so many times. All right, hopefully this will be good enough. Oh, my God. I see grass clippings there. I hope that comes up. That would be perfect. All oh, right, no. here we go. All right, so we've already done trash bags and manatees. I don't know why those are still there. So we'll Damn. Just... I know, right? So let's spin it one more time. I really need to update this. Okay, so I think we've already done school. We have. I'm going to do it one more time. One more time. So Fubar is going to be the world's greatest expert of spoons. Oh, great. You are the Wait, world's greatest. We, we, have, we have done that before, but it's going to be okay. Hold on. Okay. Okay. So don't There's a lot of things you can do. All right, so take it away. We are allowed to add, Oh, well, first of all, let me explain to everybody out there, including FUBAR, what the game means. So World's Greatest Expert means that FUBAR must give us a false lecture about the topic, which is spoons, while Katie and I can ask him questions about his expertise on the subject. So take it away, FUBAR. Well, spoons, I mean, the greatest invention ever in mankind because, you know, put down the... Uh... The, the fork and put pick up the shovel you can put more food in your mouth it's quicker you know you taste everything better like you can eat peanut butter with spoons like what more could good things can you really say about spoons well so it was actually invented go ahead, go ahead it was invented when it was invented by sir king spoon is who invented it i'm sorry i, I missed that who who Sir King Spoon. Oh, okay. Yeah. And where where was where That's was he from? Uh, he was from 
the Mediterranean in an undisclosed location. Oh, so they were like. Was he in what was he uh-huh. hiding from? Uh, you know, a lot of persecution because people thought that it was Satanism with creating a spoon and stuff because they loved the fruit. Right. Yeah, witchcraft. So if he was so scared about being found out, then why did he name the product after himself? That that seems kind of counterproductive. So it was actually mind trickery because then everybody would, you know, think they would take their hate off of him and hate the spoon itself. Okay, and so that's why how we came up with sporks. Oh, we hated the spoon and came up with sporks. Okay. So it's kind of the same the same thing as the crapper, right? Like the toilet was it was it was invented by somebody named Thomas Crapper. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. By the way, you could look that up. It's <laughs> that's actually where the term crapper came from. The toilet was invented by Thomas Crapper. I, I'm still not <laughs> following this though, because if the guy was in hiding again, I would not name the product after myself. It just doesn't seem like. Well, if he's in hiding, has he even come out yet? Like, does any, anyone know who this mofo is? Like, Ooh, is he on, oh like, no. an island in the Mediterranean where no one even, like, even heard of this mofo and he just started shipping out spoons and dropping them out of the sky? Like, is this, they, is this what's he happening? Actually, he actually changed his name to Jesus Christ, and they end up finding oh, him, shit. the Romans did. So, yeah, he ended up dying. Ooh. Was he crucified? That's what we need. No, you know what? Yep. I don't want to. Yep. So, wow. So They took his eyes out with spoons. <laughs> well, I'm, you know what? I'm trying not to get canceled this week, so I'm going to leave all of those questions on the table. I'm here for that. You are here, here for, that. for that. And you have been in yeah. church much sooner than I have been. So you have been, you have been cleansed more than me. So I'm going <laughs> to... God. He so. changed his name to Jesus Christ so he could invent spoons. All right, we heard it here first, guys. Um, let's get into our first topic this week because I do know that food bar has to be to work soon, and so I want to try to get through our topics. In fact, I'm probably going to save the VMAs for a different night. We will just talk about these two topics and then our main event as well as our weird but true um, but our first topic tonight, which one of these do you want to do, uh, Katie? One or two? Two. Okay. If you'll, all right, that's perfect. All right. So um, if you guys did not know, um, John Bon Jovi made the news recently, um, not just for a, a, a pretty awesome documentary, by the way, that is on one of the streaming platforms. I'm not sure which one. You guys would have to look that up. I've seen it. It's good. You guys should check it out. But he made the news um, a couple of days ago um, for essentially talking somebody um, out of suicide that he came in contact with just completely randomly on a bridge. Um, I'm trying to figure out, okay, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and read the article. This is from the New York Times. Uh, John Bon Jovi helped talk a woman off the ledge of a bridge in Nashville earlier this week. It was in Nashville. There you go. Uh, the police said, Mr. Bon Jovi was filming a music video on the bridge just after 6 p.m. on Tuesday uh, for The People's House, which is a song from his band's new album called Forever. Um, in a video released by the police, which I'm going to show you guys here in a minute, um, Mr. Bon Jovi and another person whom other news outlets have identified as a production assistant slowly approached the woman who was on the edge of the bridge facing outward on the far side of a railing they are seen speaking to her for a minute or so before she turns around to face them, and they lift her over the railing to safety. They meaning John Bon Jovi and her and his production assistant. Uh, Mr. Bon Jovi then hugs the woman, and the three walk together along the bridge, um, attended by law enforcement officials. The woman was taken to a hospital for evaluation, the police said. Now, a shout-out to John, and this is a quote, um, a shout-out to John Bon Jovi and his team for helping a woman in Nashville on the Seigenthaler Pedestrian Bridge Tuesday night, the police said on social media. Um, Bon Jovi helped persuade her to come off the ledge over the Cumberland River to safety. Um, Now, I've actually been near that bridge, and the Cumberland River is no joke, guys. It is literally no joke. It's very... It would, probably would not have been good for this woman if she would have jumped. Let's just put it that way. 
Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and just stop reading here, um, except to say that this pedestrian bridge, I'm going to show you guys a picture of this real quick so you can kind of see the bridge and how the river is in this area. Um, right here. This is the bridge in question. Um, so, yeah, no joke there, but I also wanted to show you guys this actual video. I thought I had this all set for y'all. Actually, you know what? I think it's the other clip. I was about to say, I think yeah. it's a different link. I think it's the other link. Yeah. So has I'm been show traced you guys by this. police after he helped a woman in distress who'd been standing on the ledge of a bridge. In a video released by the Nashville Police Department, the singer can be seen talking to the woman, and once she is back on the walkway of the bridge, he embraces her in a hug. Megan Owen has the story. The video shared by Nashville Police shows a woman in blue, highlighted in the left corner, standing precariously on the ledge of a pedestrian bridge over the Cumberland River, hanging onto the railings. Several people walk by. One woman glances back. A little further up, the rock star John Bon Jovi can be seen arriving with a camera crew. According to posts on social media, he was shooting a music video on the bridge. He immediately walks over with a crew member waves and leans on the railing. He calmly talks to the woman for less than a minute before the pair lift her over the railings back onto the bridge walkway. Bon Jovi continues to talk to the stranger before giving her a hug. They then leave the bridge together. The singer has been widely praised for his actions. It's really amazing to see. It's so good to see somebody approaching somebody who they can see is really in desperate trouble and giving them that opportunity to talk, that opportunity to share what's going on for them because it's never too late and there's always hope and that opportunity for somebody to save a life. Nashville's police department added to the praise in a post on X saying Bon Jovi helped persuade her to come off the ledge over the Cumberland River to safety. In a brief statement, Chief John Drake said, it takes all of us to help keep each other safe. Megan Owen, BBC News. And if you've been affected by either of our last two reports, you can find help and advice on the BBC Action Line. And you can find that on our so, website yeah, the actual, or via the BBC The actual app. video. Um, just incredible stuff, man. You know, there's a lot of things that um, people will just... Threats to school kids in Springfield, um, Ohio on. today following baseless claims about Haitian immigrants on. perpetuated by the former president and his running mate. Go now on. the state's Republican governor, Mike... Um, a lot of people will mind their business, right? But the fact is, mm -hmm. if she... If, if John Bon Jovi would have minded his business there, it's very likely that woman wouldn't be with us anymore. Um... Mm -hmm. And, and that's unfortunate for sure, but um, just a, a class act, uh, a very selfless act, um, just really cool stuff. Um, now, a, a, a publicist for, for John Bon Jovi said he would not be commenting on this incident out of respect for the woman's privacy. Um, in addition to releasing a new album this year, Mr. Bon Jovi was also the subject of a new documentary series that I mentioned. It aired in April on Hulu. Thank you, um, article. It's called Thank You, Good Night, The Bon Jovi Story. Uh, he was in the news this summer also when his mother passed away as well at the age of 83. I want to say, if you are watching out there, guys, if you're having thoughts of suicide um, or just thoughts of harming yourself at all, you can call or text the number 988 um, to reach the Suicide in Crisis Lifeline or you can go to speakingofsuicide.com forward slash resources for a list of additional resources. Um, if you are depressed, if you need someone to talk to, there are resources for you out there um, rather than doing the absolute worst, I would say. Right? What do you guys think of this? I think it's pretty badass because out of all the people that would have been around, first of all, like you said, the lady that walked by, but not just that, like everybody on the crew mm -hmm. and everything, like everybody there, like there was, it wasn't just like maybe two or three people here at this video shoot. There was a lot of people there. 
Guarantee you. And I watched a lot of people, if you watch the video, there, there's a, a longer video out there. Um, there's a lot of people that just walk by her that don't even... That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that don't even and acknowledge her existence. That's the sad part about the video. Yeah. The sad part of the video, you know, you see a lot of people walking by and they're just like, nope, not my problem, I'm just going to keep going, but... On Jovi's yeah. such a great person that he reaches out, he sees the, a person in need and reaches out. And mm -hmm. really cool, too, the, the most known person on the bridge probably is the one that went out of his way um, to try to yeah. save, save somebody's day, and quite literally. Um, there's a lot of things about Bon Jovi I don't agree with. This is definitely one of them. What a, a, a just a genuine heroic display. Um, by the guy, mm -hmm. so kudos to him. I also love the fact that he refuses to comment on this um, out of respect to her privacy, because that's even further. Um, obviously, this is going to be great um, publicity for him, and yeah. um, I mean, regardless of how this comes off, it's going to look great for him whether he comments on it or not, but the fact that he's, uh, even now, after the event, is still thinking about her rather than anything else just a class act um i think that's called spectator syndrome when folks avoid action assuming someone else will do something i do believe that is what it's called um thank you for that acorn um but yeah well done bon jovi um I, you know it's funny this happened like last week and i didn't learn about it until like yesterday or saturday and i i, I got mad like, I really got mad because, like, we are inundated with so much toxicity, so much division and hate and um, just so much bad all the time. And here we have an amazing story that deserves a spotlight. And, like, why are we not he hearing about this stuff more, man? It, it just it really truly angers me that we're not seeing the lighter side of human beings anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It sucks, man. We need to do better. We have to do better, honestly. Um, speaking of not doing better, Jane's addiction. Katie, take this one away, man. I, I got to hear this story. I'm excited. <laughs> you just can't fucking help yourself, can you? I love the segues. That's right. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. tell, tell us about Jane's the prequel addiction. to the Oasis reunion. I was about to fucking do it, and then you end up butting with your, uh, <laughs> shit, what would a segue for a segue be? <laughs> That's what that was. Okay. Anyway, uh, Jane's Addiction concert, uh, ends abruptly after Perry Farrell punches Dave Navarro on stage. Or is it Navarro or Navarro? Either one works. I think it's I think Navarro, it's though, perhaps. Navarro. Yeah. I think so, too. Yeah. Um, Perry's frustration had been mounting night after night. Singer's wife rides after tensions flare up between longtime bandmates at Boston show. Don't this, I swear to God, hold on. Let me try to get out of it and get back into it. It's freaking New York times. I hate the New York times. I hate when it, it like let lets you it. read it and then like you save it and then it won't let you and read it a record. second time. Uh, that's what's happening okay, to let me, me right see. now. Yeah, let me see. Nope. Nope. Have you all watch the longer videos on that? Well, we can Seems watch free. the video real quick if you want. I can load it up. Let's I've see. seen some of the lo longer ones, and, like, Navarro was in the wrong. He kept interrupting and doing yeah, guitar let's, solos, let's so I this. probably would punch him, too. There it is. There it is. <laughs> so these guys are in the same band together. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least Dave's not instigating. Yeah. No, we don't want no, Chevy over here. Get out of here. <laughs> 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 Yeah, get out of here. There's, There's no other. advertising. 
there's other clips where Dave's going up there and he like taps him on the shoulder, interrupts him singing, and just starts doing guitar riffs and stuff. So it's like, yeah, oh, he's kind of to shitty. get punched. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like I don't understand, man. Like why, why, man? <laughs> Tell me why. They're in the same <laughs> band. <laughs> They're supposed to be playing music yeah. together, right? Like, it's just like, have you seen System of a Down? I That's have. nuts. Yeah, it's like a freaking, uh, I don't know, man. But they're um, like a family. Let this me see is if I can't like, find an article that we could actually done. talk about um, that's not blocked now. So that <laughs> way <laughs> we can actually give this um, a, a little bit of a... All right, so here we go. I'll talk a little bit about it. So, uh, Jane's Addiction has offered a public apology for an on-stage scuffle that brought an early end to their show in Boston last night. Um, this was on the 14th, so this brouhaha ha happened on the 13th, right? Um, now, he was oh. reportedly upset about the stage volume that his bandmates were playing at during recent concerts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I've been part of the... Katie knows, too. Like, you're, you're part of the, the production, right? Like, getting all the levels and stuff. Well, boo fucking who? Shut the hell up. <laughs> I've been through this. I've seen it, like, before shows. I've seen it happen before Literally. shows where they'll... They'll argue with each other, like, before people are there. But <laughs> never yeah. like this. But anyway, singer Perry Farrell shoved and then punched guitarist uh, Dave Navarro, after which he was restrained and dragged off stage by the crew and bassist Eric Avery. The scuffle brought an early end to the show. You don't say. <laughs> Turn which the band was celebrating drummer Stephen Perkins' 47th birthday. <laughs> oh my god, bro, this is so much. Um, anyway, <laughs> we want to extend a heartfelt apology to our fans for the events that unfolded last night. Read the brief Instagram stories statement, which can be seen below. Um, as a result, we will be canceling tomorrow night's show in Bridgeport. Um, Jane's Addiction was scheduled to perform Sunday night at the Hartford Healthcare Amphitheater in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The next show on their itinerary is now September 18th um, at the Budweiser stage in Toronto. Um, after the show, Farrell's wife, Eddie, um, E-T-T-Y, issued her first-person account of the incident, stating that her husband had been suffering from tinnitus and a sore throat due to the band's high stage volume and suggesting that Avery may have taken some cheap shots at the singer while he was being restrained. Quote, he put Perry in a headlock and punched him in the stomach three times. Unquote. This is the, these are fucking the same band. <laughs> James and Correct me if I'm wrong, didn't, go ahead. didn't they try to get back together like back in 2009 2010 and <laughs> yeah, fell apart this, also yeah this is not this is not new but this is definitely a precursor to oh this, this is like the, the okay. opening act to oasis we know what's fit to happen <laughs> every fucking show i play with my band without uh, fail i tell my guitar player you're too loud he's like okay Every time, and he does nothing about it. And nothing, this is what no it is. Man. You just get the fuck over it. That's why I said, boo fucking who. Get That's over exactly it. That's exactly right. That's exactly my experience, too. <laughs> you're too would loud, you okay? Them hear themselves? It's like, would you rather them hear themselves oh. and not sound like shit, or... <laughs> My five-year-old grandson has better control of his tantrums than those guys. Sheesh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. So, like yeah. children. Yeah. so it says that Jane's, Jane's Addiction's current tour, which is their first to, to feature their original lineup in years, I can see why, <laughs> is currently set to conclude on October 16th in their hometown of Los Angeles. Look, there's a lot of opportunity here, Okay. Like, they, they should team up with WWE and put, like, an Elimination Chamber-style cage on the stage and just put each one of the bandmates in a different cage with a door that's locked. 
Just the perfect opportunity. Oh my god. You should have them, the bandmates of Jane's Addiction, and then the band's ma- bandmates of System of a Down and like go head to head. Yeah. <laughs> and have a have a match. Just have the, the the MMA concert, right? Jane's Addiction, System of a Down, and Oasis. And <laughs> you can just have Simon and Garfunkel can be the main uh, the main act, right? Everybody else is like opening for the folks. Oh my <laughs> god, it's so cool, man! When we first started this, Katie, I was legitimately worried that we would have enough music news to talk about every week, and boy, was I wrong! <laughs> right, <laughs> man, real. these guys make it so easy to have stuff to talk about, right? <laughs> Oh, my God. Jane's addiction fights on stage, and it's because of tinnitus, because he can't hear and he's, his throat hurts. I have tinnitus. He's a, I mean, there, he's a hard rock singer. What, what do you mean, bro? <laughs> Come on. It's, Get over it. Right. Like, you're, you're a lead singer, frontman, vocalist of a very loud genre of music. Also, a point of me that's not just talking shit. Um, are they using monitors or in ears? Mm-hmm. That's also a question. If you're supposed to be like a professional, like huge band, usually you're using in ears, and that wouldn't be a problem because you can tune everything to your liking. Mm-hmm. But it seems like they're using monitors, so that sounds like a personal fucking problem. Well, see, I'm trying to figure out how somebody as big as Jane's Addiction is not using in ears, like especially. If you've I'm got playing. yeah, if you've got tinnitus and you're dealing with the throat issues as well, and you're blaming it on the band, perhaps you should invest in something that's going to help your issues, right? They're not that expensive, right? They're really not. I mean, not I mean my guess is he probably doesn't like them for whatever reason. I mean, that's the thing as well with musicians right. or vocalists as well. Yeah, I know. Um, so let's talk about the weird but true news. I do believe Fubar has his own story this week. I'm sure Katie does as well. So I will start this, then we'll go to FUBAR, then we'll go to Katie in that order. Um, This is the Weird But True News, episode number 20 for September, whatever today's date is, 60. 60. Um, So my news story comes to us from AOL, because that's where I go for my good stuff. This is talking about an Arizona man who, after three decades... Blew a Lego piece out of his nose. Do what? <laughs> That's what I said. An Arizona man oh got the surprise of a lifetime when he blew his nose and out popped a nearly 30 year old Lego. Ben Havoc took to Instagram mm-hmm. earlier this month to explain how a small Lego dot from the 1990s, was finally dislodged. Um, When he was about six years old, he stuck a tiny circular Lego up his nose, he said in a video post. This man knew all along. Um, I don't know why I did that, he laughed. I was one of those children, he said. Now, I don't know what he means by that. (laughs) But anyway, after recognizing that the piece was far too small for him to grab himself, Havoc sent a little Lego man on a rescue mission to retrieve the yellow dot. (laughs) 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 This gets better, y'all. It gets better. Quote, I stuck the Lego man in my nose, and, of course, the Lego head popped off, he said. So now that was also stuck in my nose. (laughs) At this point, Havoc said he panicked loudly, and his mother ran in with a pair of tweezers to remove what she thought was only the stuck Lego headpiece of the man he sent in to get the other piece. Now, at 32 years old... Havoc has suffered from health problems, including asthma and sleep apnea. I'm going to show you guys a picture of this. Real quick. Here's a picture of it. Okay. It's real. It's real. Okay. So there it is. 
His doctor re recommended blowing his nose in the shower during the dry Arizona summer months to take advantage of the steam and humidity. And after regularly doing this for the last six months, Havoc suddenly blew out the Lego dot that had been in his nose for a suspected 26 years. <laughs> so what did he do then? He probably looked down and went, oh, yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you even remember that? I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know what to think of this, he said. I just got diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea. and I feel like this Lego piece has been the culprit. I'm shooketh. That's an actual quote. He said, and I quote, I am shooketh. Oh, I can breathe out of this side of my nose now, and it's fantastic, he added. I haven't been able to do that since I was a child. I can't imagine why, my dude. Uh, Havoc placed the Lego piece in a bag and intends to bring it to his doctor for further evaluation. So can we just can we just talk about the fact that this dude went to the news before he went to his doctor? <laughs> yeah. My dude was like, yo, look at this Lego piece that I found in my nose. I just wanted y'all to see it before I let my doctor go in at it and analyze this shit. <laughs> what do you mean, bro? That's like honking the horn after you hit somebody. I couldn't get an appointment for a few days, so I figured I'd just pin on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't lie. I thought you were going to say he shoved a Lego piece up his ass. I did not. And I like where you're going <laughs> with that, Colmy, but no. Uh-uh, that's not what I was going to say. Fubar, what is your weird but true news story for this week, my friend? Oh, it comes from Mirror.com. Um, people in Benidorm flock to watch uh, watch donkey pooing in Spain's most bizarre tradition. Benidorm is a resort in Spain, or in yeah, in Spain, and Benidorm witnessed the strangest tradition over the weekend as residents converged to watch donkey defecating. The peculiar event, Caga de la Burra literally translated as poo from the donkey unfolded yesterday in various towns across Spain's Sunkiss Alicante province. Uh, I love the fact that the word unfolded is in there. <laughs> yeah. uh, local That's YouTuber good. Benidorm by Anna up uploaded footage explaining this unusual custom, dubbing it as one of the strangest traditions in the entire world. And explained how onlookers encircle a free roaming donkey sesquared, contained within a marked zone carved into numerous small numbered sections. Expectant participants take 10 euros on these numbered zones and could win up to 1,000 euros if they correctly guess the plot that would be graced by the donkey's dropping. <laughs> Sounds like chicken shit bingo, it doesn't appears, it, Katie? <laughs> yeah. You ever played chicken shit bingo? Very popular. Mm -hmm. I've never. Okay. Go ahead, Fubo. Uh, all, all fifty of all five hundred of the number plots were purchased at the event, and the town mayor accompanied the donkey to the festival area, where there was also live music, bars, and food stalls. The competition tagline is "Never have a shit given you so much." <laughs> Ever has a shit given you? <laughs> this year's festivities has been heralded as a resounding triumph with organizers taking to Instagram to express their gratitude and announcing it will return next year. They said we would like to express our most sincere thanks to all the people who joined and collaborated in the traditional celebration, for those who helped organize and participated and enjoyed it with us, each one of the fundamental part making this event a success. What country was oh, this yeah. again? In Spain. They, Spain? Spain. Of course. So Spain, they, they really love to watch donkeys defecate. There you go. Nothing like watching an ass shit. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, no, that's essentially what chicken shit bingo is. So what, <laughs> what you would do is you would you, you get this cage... And you put like a bingo pad at the bottom of the cage, and then you put a chicken in there, and then you do whatever you want to do. Like you can have a music show or whatever, and then whenever like people buy numbers, 
You know what I'm saying? Like, you buy a square of the bingo board, and wherever the fucking chicken shits, that's who wins. Whatever number the shit is this lands a on. Thing? Yeah, this is a real thing. I learned about this <laughs> this year. I literally went to a concert where they were doing chicken shit bingo. I've heard of it. I didn't know it was actually done. It's really, oh, wow. Wow. truly done. I've seen it happen. Like, still. And, like, literally, it does not smell good at all. Oh, I've had chickens, I know. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, chicken shit is I not good. I up and got an ass. Yeah, that's Jackson right. Jackson tells me all the time, I had two pet chickens. Um, I, there's a picture of me somewhere. I had, like, strawberry blonde hair, and one of them was, like, orange and Red, you probably saw this, and I had the chicken sitting on my head. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a picture of that chicken somewhere. Um, so what is your but, weird but true uh, news, Katie? God. <laughs> Lord. Okay. So, this is about how stupid our fucking country is. Uh, no, <laughs> not the country, the people in the country. Okay. We're not talking politics. Okay. Anyway, moving on. Um... And this is why I'm not on fucking TikTok. Okay. Beauty lovers are eating dirt. Claiming it has health benefits. Quote. Can't nobody make me stop eating it. Period. Okay. Anyway. (laughs) It's not longer. It's not longer. That's what this says. It's not longer. It's no longer their dirty little secret. Okay. Um, crunchers. <laughs> what? There's a whole term for it. Crunch. Oh my god. <laughs> no. I didn't read any of this. Just... You shouldn't. Like, you should never read it until we're live, to be no. honest, because it just makes it so no. much better. Crunchers, or folks with affinities for feasting on dirt. <laughs> Aren't hiding under rocks. <laughs> Shit. That's where they're, that's their uh, vacation spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, God, I've gotten through two fucking sentences. <laughs> okay. Instead, shameless soil connoisseurs across the internet are proudly promoting the wellness and beauty benefits of chowing down on the ground. I fucking love the New York Post, okay? I don't know who's writing this shit. The puns are amazing, bro. The puns are great. They're so (laughs) good. Okay. Oh, my God. Want to improve your child's and your own gut health? Asked mom Stephanie Adler of Fertility and hormone coach of her TikTok followers in the closed captions of a post, eat dirt. (laughs) One teaspoon of of organic biodynamic soil has more microorganisms than humans on Earth. The pro wrote, as a baby, much dry mud in the background. Okay, this is when child abuse comes in. Okay, <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? How are, oh my god, there's a video. Oh my god, it's here. And the kid is actually on the ground digging up dirt with his hands and hey. shoving it in its mouth. It's, it's like balls of mud. It's tough times, man. Tough times, you know? Uh, <sighs> what? These stories are great. What? They so are. Oh my god. You know, as a kid, we would eat like the mud cups and it was like pudding with Oreos and worms. Yep. You know, fake mud. We wouldn't eat actual mud. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've Sacks all of... eaten the actual mud pies, right? Like, we've all had that. <laughs> or is that just me? Yeah. yeah. Not me. Um, <laughs> listen to this shit. Another one. Sacks of the surface. Typically made available in the form of indigest, indigestible, ingestible clay can range in cost from around $11 to $27, depending on the quality and quantity. So people are buying, quote, sacks of the surface. Oh, my God. People are buying, or- they're buying organic dirt to eat. One 
One Amazon vendor touts their eleven ninety nine edible red, red clay as an anti aging tool, claiming it unclogs the pores from sebum, tightens pores, and has anti aging effects. Yeah, no. It helps. No, none of this is right. None of this is okay. I'm not. I'm not dirt. gonna be a cruncher. Okay. No, we are not crunchers. We are anti crunchers. Crunch. We are anti crunch. That's right. <laughs> Anti crunch here on the show. Though. Yeah, we could we could go into the crunch business though. <laughs> we'll sell them dirt. Yeah, I got plenty of dirt oh, over yeah. here. We got multiple different kinds of dirt over here, motherfucker. We could I get into sand. all kinds of food groups. You know what I'm saying? Shoot. I got yeah. sand, bitch. Yeah, I got sand too. We got red dirt. We got black dirt. We got freaking all, all kinds of dirt. Of shit I, I can hook a brother up, bro. We'll go inside tree roots and shit too. We'll, we'll call it fake dirt. Whatever. You know what I'm saying? We'll break down rocks and shit. Fertilized dog dirt. Yeah, there. fertilized dog dirt right there from the dog pen. <laughs> <laughs> Extra <laughs> flavor. <laughs> that's called that's called recycled recycled organic, right? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Let's get into our top topic today so our friend can get to work tonight. I know he's running late, so we're gonna try to get through as much of this as we can. The first thing I want to talk about, we're gonna talk about good cops versus bad cops. Um, is it systemic? How can we fix it? How can we make it better? Um, and why uh, really I want to talk to Fubar why he thinks there are so many veteran police officers that are getting this wrong most of the not most of the time, but some of the time. Um, and, I mean, let's talk about the most recent um, action in the news where, thankfully, the person in question was not injured in any way, was not killed or shot at or tasered or any of that. But, however, because of the fame of this individual, it has brought this, this subject back to the forefront um, of the news. Uh, and perhaps if you're not even a sports fan, you may not have heard of this, but I'm going to show you guys a brief video. I think it's about a minute long, um, of a wide receiver from the Miami dolphins. His name, um, is Tyreek Hill. Now, let me see if I can't figure out where this video is now. Um, it's about a minute long that I wanted to show. <clears throat> and now it's not here. It's like I had this ready, and now it's not here. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, saw it. Go on YouTube real quick and type in Tyreek Hill. It pops up about everywhere. All right, I got it now. You I were. Think. I think I got it. I thought you had a link in the doc. I do. Um. All right. So hopefully this will do what we need it to do. Here we go. All right, guys, so I just want to show you guys this quick video of what happened, and then um, we can talk about the um, the behavior of the cops, the behavior of the individual in the car, and all of that, what went wrong, what went right, et cetera, et cetera. But here is the video of the um, situation. They don't knock on my window like that, man. Don't knock on Why my don't you have your seatbelt on? Don't knock on my window. Why like don't you have your seatbelt on? Don't knock on my window like that, though. No. Like what? Don't knock on my window like that. Why you have it up? Don't knock on my window like that. Why you have it up? I have to knock to let you know I'm here. Don't knock that way on my you can lower it and talk Just to you. Just get my ticket, bro, so I can go. I'm finna be late, gang. Do what you gotta do. What? What? Keep it down. Hey! Keep your window down. What? What? Daddy. Hey, yeah. keep your window down. Don't tell me what keep your window down, I'm gonna get you out of the car. As a matter of fact, get out of the car. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Get out of the car. Give me break that get, window. get out of the car. Get out. get out of the car right now. We're not playing this game. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. What part of the building you doing this time? Hey, Drew. Hey, Drew, I'm getting arrested, dude. I'm getting arrested. I'm getting arrested, Drew. I'm getting up. Twin. When we tell you to do something, you do it. I'm you understand? Up. I'm up, you bro. understand? Not what you want, but what we tell you. Hold on, Twin. Hold on. Hold on, bro. 
I just had surgery on my knee. I just had surgery on my knee, bro. I just had surgery on my knee, bro. I just had surgery, really? surgery, surgery in your ears when we go there with you with the bell. Bro, chill, bro, All right. The fuck? Aisha, let me just play again because now we have the sound. Don't want politics. Get out of here. <clears throat> All right, so... That was the situation. Now, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of background, and I'm going to kind of interview FUBAR here a little bit on this situation. Because FUBAR has, um, essentially, that's his job. What we just saw is FUBAR's job. That's what he does. He does traffic stops all day, every day. So um, I definitely want to get his information here, but I want to give you guys some background. This happened Sunday afternoon, or whenever the game was. Uh, I, I forget what day it was. It doesn't really matter. But it was. It happened the same day that Tyree Kill was was due to to play in a game. It might have been Thursday night football, actually. I don't know. It doesn't matter though. Um, but he was on the way to the stadium and supposedly was right outside the stadium. He was speeding. Now this is very important. He was speeding. That's why he was pulled over. He was speeding. He was doing like a sixty and a forty or something like that. And all of a sudden, he had all of these cops there for speeding, which is the first thing that I, I'm a little bit worried about. Like, there's a lot of overkill here for somebody who's supposedly just speeding, yeah. right? Um, and um, the second part of that video is after they had already restrained him. It's really hard to tell, but if you watch the whole situation from beginning to end, and that video is out there as well, they have already detained him. His hands are or, or um, handcuffed behind his back when they pull him to the ground. And that's when he is screaming, I just had surgery, I just had surgery. Um, he's already detained at that point. He's already handcuffed and all of that. So as far as the standpoint of his behavior, meaning Tyreek Hill, what do you feel like he did wrong, FUBAR? Uh, so right from the beginning, you could tell he's, I hate to say it, like a lot of celebrities to where he wanted entitlement. And that's why he kept rolling up his window because he said that he was trying to call his security manager for the Dolphins that said that he was going to try and get him out of whatever he did wrong. He, so he just made the thing, he, the whole situation more difficult. So he was acting like a date card. I agree. <laughs> so I had problems with everything that he was doing um, at first. So. Uh, there was a whole lot of, yeah. in my opinion, there was a lot of wrong on both sides here. But right from the beginning of the situation, um, I hate to say it like this, but all of us, when we're pulled over, we need to understand, um, all of us, regardless of what color we are or whatever, we need to understand that the people that are on the other side of that window, the ones with the weapons, are the ones that are putting their lives on the line every single day. So we need to try to make sure that whatever we do as somebody who's being pulled over is doing the right things to not pose a risk to those people. That's the very first thing. Show your hands. Um, do what you're told, regardless of what it is. Um, well, I, I won't say regardless of what it is, because you do have certain laws that you, uh, and certain rights that you have. But honestly, you know, when, when a cop knocks on your window, you roll your window down. You know, especially when you got tint like that, because... The, oh, yeah. the, the police officer is not going to know what's happening on the other side of that window if it's tinted like that. And that's a direct um, a direct risk to the well-being of the officer, in my opinion. So when I see that situation right from the start where Tyree Kill is really making this seem like it's just ho-hum, give me my ticket and I'll be on my way. Like, no, bro, like you have to play the game. Like you have to do the right things. And by doing so, you keep yourself safe. Uh, so first things first, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't always defend the officer. But at the beginning of this video, I would defend the officer just that he didn't overreact, didn't blow out the window. Um, and, and, you know, because I've seen situations where they roll the window up with tint and the police officer will, they have tools to just break that window immediately Um so that they have visuals on the people inside the vehicle. I've seen it, right? And the officer didn't do that. So that was the first thing I noticed. Like, he didn't take that step. Um, what do you feel, FUBAR, at first? Did the police officers do anything wrong up to the point of dragging him from the vehicle? Yeah, when they made that first contact and stuff, and, you know, he knocks on the window, and Tyreek immediately just don't knock on my window and starts rolling it back up, you know, that's like you drop their safety. And whether it's Tyreek Hill or whoever, you know, nobody's 
we don't know what's inside his vehicle. So if he's rolling up that video, we don't know, or that window, we don't know what he's doing inside that vehicle, if he's concealing something, has a weapon or anything like that. So that's a huge red flag to us. So yeah, immediately open that door and make sure he, he's not doing something he shouldn't be doing. And and then the whole dragging out. But, you know, it, it just... The whole the whole interaction from the get-go just starts off so bad because Tyreek's not cooperative. The officer, you can tell, is amped up, you know, because the officer's just like, why are you not wearing your seatbelt? Why are you not wearing your seatbelt? You know, it's just like, just identify yourself, get to the basics, and then we can proceed from there. But Tyreek wanted to win- roll up the window and not talk. Well, right from the get-go, you can tell that Tyreek was very argumentative, um, which is already going to be a situation. And so, like you said, the officer is getting amped up. And, and I'm going to say in this situation, the officer might have a reason to be a little amped up. You have some really tinted windows. Um, and as soon as those windows go up, man, that's that's his livelihood. That's his life that's at stake. He doesn't know anything about this guy at this standpoint of the stop. He doesn't know what's in the car, what isn't in the car, who the person is. He has none of that information yet. So, um, again, I can understand that amp up. Now, let's fast forward to the, to the end of the video. When Tyreek is already detained, he's already um, in cuffs, and they're still dragging him to the ground. This is where I have problems with the officers not de-escalating the situation and making it worse. Do you feel that same way, Fubar? Yeah, so they, you know, I understand that they wanted him to sit on the curb, and he was refusing to sit on the curb. And that's another safety issue for him, for Tyreek and for the officers, because by sitting him on the curb, then he's not more amped up to take off running on them. So mm-hmm. I understand it, but at the same time, like, you didn't have to, you know, grab him by the neck, force him down. Because, like, I mean, I, I think he was playing victim a little bit, I mean, but it is very possible that he just had surgery and could he could be making an injury much worse. Yeah, I just feel like, uh, again, I've never been a police officer, which is why I love having you here, and I want to talk about each of these cases a little bit at a time. But And Katie, please, you know, um, interject if you feel like you have something to yeah, say. Yeah, I'm taking it all in. Okay. Um, yeah. Again, I feel like it was just uh, a, a couple of guys that perhaps were letting things go a little too far. And honestly, this could have had a far different outcome. Um, than what we got. Now, the officer in question is, um, I'm not going to name his name, um, that doesn't matter, but the officer in question is a 27-year veteran on the force. And that's where I have a real problem, because he should know better. There should be better... Uh, there should be better systems in place, and I'm sure there are in certain places across the country, to prevent this exact thing from happening and i i can see definitely some of the officers training and not you know escalating this into where you know tyreek is shot or or tasered or or you know whatever that we've seen so many times over the years um so i'm glad it didn't have that outcome but at the same time you can still see that there's some discrepancies here between what this officer should have known and what he actually did um, and that's where my concerns are here. So let me put it to you like this, Fubar. What do you feel from the standpoint of the officer? Because you can't control what the subject is going to do or say, right? You can't ever do that until you actually have control of the situation fully. And I don't imagine that's ever the case until you have them literally back at the station, right? That's when you have complete control of the situation. Or if they're in the back of your squad car, I imagine that feels probably like complete control as well. But what could the officers have done better in this situation to make it so that this wasn't a big news story the next day? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty simple. So, you know, you open his door, and now you have complete view of him. Now, if he wants to sit there in his car and act a fool and stuff, like... Give him a little bit more opportunity. I mean, just say, hey, step out of the vehicle or we're going to force you out and stuff and explain things to him. And if you watch the whole, I think there's like 26 minutes of video body cam out there. If you watch it all, some of the other officers besides this 27-year-old veteran, they because they detain some of the um, other teammates. players that right. come and assist, yep, teammates that come to a, 
assist Tyreek, and they explain to him what's going on and stuff, and it's, it's de-escalated. But this 27-year veteran that had has had multiple suspensions and stuff, he just, he, he was ready to rock that day. He did not want any nonsense, and he was very amped up. So it's just like, you got to learn those de-escalation because, you know, sometimes, I mean, now if Tyreek still acts like that, yeah, sometimes you got to knock some sense into people, but, and show them that you're not going to mess around. But at the same time, I catch a lot more flies with honey than I do vinegar. Absolutely. I agree with you. And, and as somebody who has been stopped before, um, I mean, obviously, um, you know, honey's always going to work better for sure. Um, it just feels like me in this situation, and again, we're going to talk about some much different outcomes here in a minute, um, and much really well-known issues um, that have happened over the years, but it would seem to me like if any of these police officers really felt like they were not safe, then they would have backed off from the vehicle, correct? And then they would have yep. what they do, what they call bullhorning, in which case maybe it's not called that. For, 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 from your standpoint, Fubar, but essentially what they would do is they would they would retreat back to their vehicles, they would get back behind their doors, and they would bullhorn commands at the, the vehicle, essentially open, roll your window down, open the car with your left hand, or open the door with your left hand, whatever the commands are, they would bullhorn it or speakerphone it, megaphone it, whatever you want to call it, from the safety of their own vehicle. That way they're not really up close to where they could be shot at or... But it didn't. That didn't happen. So when that doesn't happen, and I've seen that a million times on these body cams, when that doesn't happen, it feels to me like the police officers didn't feel threatened by this situation because they didn't retreat. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No. They they definitely didn't feel threatened whatsoever because they, you know, when they open that door and stuff and they're ripping him out, like at that point they're just looking for a fight essentially. That's what I felt, too. And, again, uh, Tyreek didn't act right. I mean, and I think he came out and even said, look, you know, I could have handled this a lot better. And um, as somebody who's seen the video, I agree. Yeah, you could have handled this a lot better. And thank goodness something far worse didn't happen because I've seen, I've literally seen people shot and killed for doing a lot less than what Tyreek Hill did in this in this traffic stop. Um, and I'd like to talk about some of those as well. Let's talk about the most famous one first. George Floyd, obviously, everybody's seen that video. Um, what could have happened differently um, on the George Floyd stuff, uh, FUBAR? What's your opinion on that? You know, the George Floyd one, very tragic incident and stuff, you know, that he lost his life. But essentially, when I take somebody into custody, you're now my child. You're now my baby. So if I've got you in handcuffs, and you're in any kind of distress or anything like that, it's on me to immediately call EMS or take care of you, render you that aid. And the same thing with, you know, I can't, I'm not going to place you face down and put my knee on you because pushing that pressure on that diaphragm causes you to not be able to breathe very well. You, you got to take care of a person, whether they're on drugs, acting fool, whatever it is, you need to take care of that person and everybody's well-being is the number one priority. And so, really, uh, it boils down to that the police officer, the peace officer, is supposed to be the neutrality part of this, right? You're supposed to be neutral no matter what. You can't be racist. You can't be political. You can't be prejudiced. You have to be the voice of reason through all of this, right? Yeah, no matter what the situation going on or anything like that, you always want to be that level, calm person that is thinking of how can we improve and make resolve this situation, you know, and make and, and priority number one is always to save life. Mm -hmm. Life is always, you know, life is what's most precious. So it's that's what you always want to take into consideration when making any decision. Well, I feel like um, again, this is a situation that we see a lot. We have one officer that's in charge. We have a bunch of other officers that are kind of taking the lead from the person who's in charge. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on the way you look at this, your perspective, um, all of these officers got charged with um, uh, multiple crimes, whatever they were. We don't have to talk about the the crimes and what they were charged with, what they were convicted with. We all saw the video, 
And um, somehow we all get a different perspective of the video. We all have different opinions of the video. The video is pretty damning, in my opinion, um, on the officer in, in question. Uh, Chauvin, I think, was his name. Um, and whether you believe it was manslaughter, murder, whatever, um, I, I feel like the officer was culpable, yeah? Yeah, I mean, yeah. when somebody's going through distress like that and you're, you know, putting your knee in their neck, back area, whatever, causing them even more stress, I mean, you're you're contributing to the the circumstances what ultimately led to his death. So you are a part of that. So whatever statue that meets that law violation of how you made him lose his life, then you should be held accountable. So um, one thing I'd, I really want to talk to you about, Fubar, is, is um, the subject, right? Now, in this case, the subject is George Floyd. In the first case, it was Tyreek Hill. The subject that you're dealing with, whether you're arresting them, detaining them, or just talking to them in a regular, you know, non-violent um, stop, the subject is not always going to be truthful with you. They will lie. They will do whatever they can to get out of handcuffs or, or resist or whatever. So as the peace officer, and you just mentioned that the, your detainee is your baby, it's your responsibility to make sure they're okay. Do you have to take their word for their health situation, even if you feel like they might be lying? Isn't it first and foremost the health that matters rather than anything else? Oh, yeah, 100%. You know, even if they are, you know, just trying to buy themselves time or get out of getting arrested or whatever, if anybody says to me that, hey, I don't feel good or something, okay, I'm going to be calling EMS and they're going to come check you out. Yeah. Then it's on EMS to make sure whether this person's lying or not. And it's, it's just about time. It, what, what does it really hurt to call somebody in ambulance, have them checked out, make sure everything's kosher, just so that they don't lose their life? That's right. Uh, that's what I was looking for because I know the training. Um, I've never been a police officer, but I do know the training. And the training is supposed to be EMT first, arrest second, um, hospital first, jail second. It's always supposed to be, be well-being over detention. And correct me if I'm wrong on that, Fubar, but I'm pretty sure that's pretty standard, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay, so that's the George Floyd case. Again, you guys probably all know. I just want to get Fubar's opinions on each of these because each of these cases have unique circumstances. Um, and then I have the, the biggest question or a couple of really big questions for Fubar at the end of all this. Um, the, the third one I want to talk about is, um, let me get there. Um, Rayshard Brooks. Now, if you guys are not familiar with Rayshard Brooks, Rayshard Brooks is from, was from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, he was clearly intoxicated. Um, he, the, the police were called on him because he fell asleep, um, in his vehicle at a Wendy's parking lot in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, I, I'm not going to show the video here. My plans originally tonight was I was going to show each of these videos and then have Fubar commentate on them and ask him questions about them. Um, but these videos are pretty damn graphic, and I don't really want to um, put that out there. But I just want to let you guys know, if you want to know what we are talking about, go search out the video for yourself. Watch the situation unfold, so that way you know what we are talking about. But essentially, the uh, order of events for this one... Um, is they approach this man who is clearly intoxicated and they start what is called field sobriety on this man, okay? Um, and again, field sobriety, I'm sure Fubar will agree, the, the, the different techniques for field sobriety are going to differ from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Each place has their own way of doing things, so you, you, it's never always going to be the same walk the line or touch your nose or whatever. Each place is going to do things differently on that. But essentially what ends up happening in this situation is um, he starts resisting, he being Rayshard Brooks, he starts resisting, and the officer threatens him and says, um, you know, don't make me tase you, don't make me tase you. And he ta both officers, two of them, they both have their tasers out. And somehow or another, Rayshard Brooks ends up in possession of one of the officer's tasers. And then he starts to exit the scene, meaning he starts running across the parking lot. And at one point in time, you can see him move his fist back with the taser in his hand like he's going to fire at... 
um, the officer that is in pursuit, okay? And they end up shooting and killing this guy, all right? So I have a couple of questions. Have you seen the video, Fubar, that I sent you? Yeah, I, I've seen the video. Okay, so what, uh, what, what, if anything, do you feel the officers did wrong in this situation? You know, it's, it's about controlling the situation. So you got an intoxicated person. Intoxicated people can be, you know, up, down. It's a roller coaster of emotions with intoxicated people. So just control the situation. If he starts getting aggressive, then put him in cuffs. I mean, you already have your proof that he's intoxicated. Control the situation, get him in detained, so that way he's not a threat to the public or a threat to you guys anymore. But it went sideways, and he gets one of their tasers. I, you can argue, argue deadly force there. I'm kind of surprised they didn't get charged. That's just my opinion. It, it's a very bad deal but so a little bit of background on this yeah. Rayshard Brooks was coming from his daughter's birthday party um, and he was wrongfully behind the wheel of a vehicle uh, I think most people would agree with that um, but he rightfully pulled over to sleep it off rather than continue to drive this is conjecture but uh, I mean that's what there's this is from the official um, police officer report that supposedly he pulled into the Wendy's parking lot to sleep it off, quote-unquote. Now, the original reports had Rayshard Brooks falling asleep while in line at the Wendy's drive-thru, um, which was complete bullshit, by the way. That's not how it happened. He was literally off to the side, parked in a parking spot, sleeping. And for some reason, somebody called the cops on him. And that's something I want to talk to you about later, Fubar, about the some reason somebody called the cops on him. Um, now... It is my, um, it is under my belief that, um, short of c gaining control of a situation, is it not always your goal to de-escalate as much as possible? Yeah, it's definitely you want to de-escalate and make things go as smooth as possible. And, you know, I, I hate to say it, but at the end of the day, like, I'm not going to chase after an OWI guy. I mean, he can no longer drive, so he's no longer a threat to me or the public. If he runs off, he runs off. He passes out in the field and sleeps it off. Right. Uh, you know, do we really need to escalate it? Like, uh, yeah. So, Fubar, you and I have not talked about this at all, right, before this, right? I'm hearing your opinions for the first nope. time right now on these, right? Yep, this is, this is my opinion. I completely agree with what you're saying. My issue with this situation was the man was running away. He was running away. He wasn't aggressive towards the police. He was literally running away from the police, which obviously is against the law. I will be the first person to agree with that. He was resisting arrest, and he was running away. My point is, again and again and again and again and again, is he was running away when he was shot and killed he wasn't running towards them he wasn't aggressively trying to injure a police officer now you could say that he was reaching back with the taser to possibly um taser the officer who was in pursuit by the way and that's the problem i have i feel like the officers being in pursuit is the opposite of de-escalating that situation now, a lot of people would say, you know, the whole fuck around, find out. If you don't want to be shot by the police, then do what the police say. And I agree with you, on uh, agree with those folks in most circumstances. But, you know, when you're sleeping off, uh, um, you know, being drunk or whatever, and you're, you're all of a sudden you've got these bright spotlights in your face and people are screaming at you, get out of the car, get out of the car, which is exactly what's on uh, the body cam footage of the, these police were in his face, like, spotlights and the whole nine i can't imagine just going from sleeping to that like the fear and anxiety of that i'm not saying that's that's why he did what he did we'll never know the point i'm making is is he was running away and i agree the, the cop should have been charged with something this man was shot three times in the back and that's how he died that's how he died he was shot in the back that's my problem with that situation um i feel do you feel like the police should have let him go once the taser was taken from their from their possession you know yeah because like at that point then you you know if he's running away a taser only has a range of like 30 feet 
But it's not like he grabbed my gun. If he grabbed my gun, we got a whole different. You got to put him down, then. Absolutely. The taser. Yeah, taser very limited. And to my conjecture on this one too, they already ID'd him and everything. They knew who he was. So if he runs off, put out arrest warrant for him and catch him later, and and you can charge him with, you know, dearming an officer and all those charges. Mm-hmm. I mean, him run away. It's not like he was somebody that had threatened to blow up a McDonald's or something like that. It was literally a a drunk driving. Yeah. And um, uh, too many times these situations are for minor things. George Floyd was for passing a $20 counterfeit bill. Um, This one was for a guy that was sleeping off a drunk at a Wendy's parking lot. Um, And we're going to go to the third, the fourth case here, which is Breonna Taylor. Um, Katie, are you familiar with the Breonna Taylor story? Ish. So this is about like no basic. no knock warrants, um, which are complete bullshit. And I hope I know they're illegal wherever she was killed now, but they should be illegal everywhere. That's my opinion. I'll get Fubar's opinion on that in a minute. But just the background on this story: um, the police in wherever they were from um, had a warrant, and um, they were allowed to serve the warrant without having to knock or or identify themselves as police or anything like that they're just allowed to go in this is this was the law at the time they're just allowed to go in and somehow or another they were at the wrong address okay and they they served this warrant by essentially not knocking and going into this apartment and brianna taylor's boyfriend not knowing who was in his apartment shot at the officers injured one of the officers and then they opened fired on Brianna Taylor and killed her instantly. They were at the wrong house, okay? And then afterwards these police officers covered it up. They took evidence from the scene. They hid evidence. They um all of this is public record. Um and unfortunately very recently um a Supreme Court has given them I don't know which court uh, that's why I said a Supreme Court um, gave them immunity from this. Um, so, first of all, uh, I guess first question: How do you feel about no knock warrants, Fubar? Well, uh, just backtracking a little bit on like the facts of it. Like Thank as you. far as I know, so they were at they had the warrant on that address because they believed she was receiving. Uh, packages because the the person that they were actually looking for is a drug dealer and they believe that she was it was an ex boyfriend was receiving packages there so they got a warrant for her house okay no knock warrant it's it's like I I I understand no knock warrants because you know when you're dealing with these gangs or cartels hit it fast and strong and you want to get the surprise on them but you're gonna get a shootout if you're going into these possible you know, risky places, or like Breonna Taylor's boyfriend at the time, that was a, he had a permit to carry, to permit to have that gun and stuff, and somebody breaks into my house, yeah, I'm, I'm going to shoot first, ask questions later. I'm not going to be like, hey, who's at my door, and wait for them to shoot me first. Right. So it, it's definitely a very tricky situation. So it's, uh, you know, it's a very tragic deal, very poor planning, because, you know, and there, it's very murky on whether the officer's identified themselves because you know they did the no knock warrant but then they planned to knock and so supposedly they knocked and they heard them pound on the door but then they never identified themselves and we get this tragic shootout and Brianna's caught in the crossfire and so uh, they to my knowledge have never released the body cam footage from the actual event um, the body cam footage I have seen starts up after Brianna is already shot and killed, and they are essentially backing um, Kenneth Walker up with the help of a canine, um, and they're having him back up towards them. Um, that's the only body cam I could see on it, and that leads me to believe a lot of things. Um, uh, number one, why are we hiding this from the public? Um, uh, aside from obviously, you know, you don't want to see her murdered or whatever, but I mean, that's stuff that you can, you can, um, blur out or whatever. Um, but I mean, if a cop is in the right, they're not going to try to cover something up a- after it's over. Right. I mean, that, that's pretty damning to me. 
Yeah, it definitely does not look good that you don't have any body cam whatsoever or, or, you know, very limited body cam of the situation because at the end of the day, the body cam will exonerate you if you're in the right. Mm -hmm. So if there's not body cam, and it it kind of looks pretty suspicious on a person when there's no body cam. And the body cam footage they did show actually shows these officers trying to cover this shit up too, by the way. They actually have released body cam footage of the cover-up or part of the cover-up that they allege um, that was happening. Um, here's my opinion on this, right? You have um, what used to be no-knock warrants, which were legal, and then you have other laws called castle laws or home domicile laws where you are allowed legally to defend your property um, if you feel like it's under attack. Um, I don't know. I, I assume that's everywhere, but in the state of Texas, like if somebody walks into my house, I can legally fire upon them without knowing who they are. I don't have to ask who you are or why you're here. So it would seem like that is in direct um, opposition to a no-knock warrant. It just feels like it's a, a recipe for failure and catastrophe. A no-knock warrant in Texas is asking to be shot, period. I don't give a fuck what you say. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. Like, like, like they're going to get shot. That's just what it is. I mean, I don't understand anyone. I mean, I get it, like, with what Fubar was saying, like, and, like, cartels kind of thing. I, I get it. But as soon as you bust the fuck in and people see you, police. Yep. That's what you say. Police. And from what I understand, um, the man in question who, again, Fubar rightfully said is, was legally carrying... Um, he had a permit for the mm -hmm. weapon that he had. He fired yeah. upon the officers because he did not know who was in his house all of a sudden. Yeah. This was done at like 2 o'clock in the morning. So, I mean, God, the same kind of situation as the guy at Wendy's. Like, all of a sudden, you've got these people in your house. In your house! You don't know who they are. Like, you have no clue who they are. You don't know if they're police because they haven't told you that they're police. And like Fubar yep. said, it would seem pretty simple to me that if you just want to wrap this up, just show me the body cam footage of them announcing themselves as police before the man fires on them. And if you can show me that, then this case is over. Yep. It would seem very simple. And that's what... The and that's where it got really murky, too, is because they had a neighbor that sat there and went back and forth of, oh, yeah, I think that the, the cop said something. And then they said, well, maybe not. Maybe they just knocked. I did hear a loud banging. And so it, this neighbor really went back and forth. But then the day to me, it's like, why do a no-knock warrant on somebody that you think just receiving packages? This wasn't an active drug dealer or anything like this. It's somebody receiving packages and could be a mule. You know, that's, that's not a dangerous person. Why do a no-knock warrant on this? Yeah, it just it seemed like overkill right from the start. It seemed like it was destined to uh, create this kind of havoc, to be honest. Like, it just, I don't know, man. I'm glad that it seems like no-knock warrants have gotten, gotten the, um, the scrutiny that they deserve, and hopefully they'll never be allowed to be done again. And I understand uh, what you were saying about the... Um, the justification for having them. It makes sense, but at the same time, if if one innocent person dies because of a law, then that law should be changed, even if it is a benefit in certain situations. Um, that's my opinion, though. Um, last one on uh, that I wanted to talk to Fubar, and uh, honestly, this one to me is by far the most tragic. By far the most tragic. Um, this is Philando Castile. This happened in the state of Minnesota. Um, and uh, honestly, every time I hear this man's name, I, I honestly get emotional. That's how tragic this one was. A little bit of a background. Again, pulled over for brake lights. I'm not kidding, y'all. I'm not kidding. This man and his wife or girlfriend were pulled over because two of his three brake lights were not functioning. And he ended up in a body bag. And that's a problem for me. That is a huge problem for me. Because in this video, I'm assuming you saw it, Fubar, I sent it to you? Yeah. In this video, the officer, correct me if I'm wrong, the officer asks Philando Castile to give him his, um, his paperwork, essentially, which is just like every other stop you're ever going to have, uh, registration, insurance, license, whatever, and when he reaches to get the information that the police officer asked for, 
the officer opens fire on this man and literally kills him. In, in, in my opinion, in cold blood. There was literally no reason for this shit to go down. Fubar, tell Absolutely. how do you feel about this situation? Oh, I would love to lo know a little bit more about the author because that author, you know, he obviously had some kind of trauma in his career to where he was very, very, and I don't want to say trigger happy, but like, you know, he's dealt with somebody with a gun where he's almost lost his life or something because the way that interaction happened is he's like, hey, your brake lights, your third brake light and your other brake lights out can i get your license and insurance and he's like okay and right away the gentleman says i've got a firearm on me and he starts to reach for his uh license and the officer's like don't reach for it don't reach for it and then it shoots him it's like okay i understand your safety there but at the same time like it's just why are you so quick to shoot a person well, again, um, if if this man wanted to hurt you with the with the weapon that he had, he wouldn't announce that he has a weapon. That's first of all. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And uh, I I might be mishearing, but correct me if I'm wrong. In the video I saw, he knows about the weapon, meaning the officer knows about the presence of the weapon, and he still gives him the command to give me your license and registration. After the weapon has already been talked about. Is that true? Or am I misremembering? No, they, he asked for the license first. And then that's when he starts telling him about the firearm. And then as he's going to, he says, just to let you know, I've got a firearm on me. And he's like, okay, don't reach or don't get it out or whatever. Well, he must have, uh, he must have been reaching for his wallet. And so the officer's like, don't reach for it. Don't reach for it. And then he just starts shooting it. And it's like, okay. You gotta control the situation. Uh, again, it's it's so easily control the situation. You know, just say, "Hey, put your hands up on the steering wheel" or something. You know, if he keeps continuing to not listen to your commands, then that's on him. But you literally gave him one command of "Don't reach for it" and then shot him. And he's when you ask for it, and, and uh, I mean, license, if, the, the video is is and honestly, this particular video is why i decided not to show um the videos of all of these tonight uh it's just heartbreaking it, it is so heartbreaking yeah. because it's so fast and it's so many shots like this wasn't just you know pop this was pop 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 like he was shooting like it was at least three or four shots that i heard if not more and his wife is screaming the whole time you know you just killed my boyfriend you just killed my boyfriend and um, they show her the side of the video. The and there was a four-year-old in the back seat as well. Um, yeah. Long story short, the officer that was charged in this shooting um, was acquitted of second-degree manslaughter. This man will not serve any time for this. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I just don't think that's right. Mm -mm. Um. And this one is hard because, again, he does, again, he gives the command, don't reach for it. But, like, in that short amount of time, you give him a command to give you his license and registration. And then you yep. find out about a weapon, not from your own police work, but because of the subject, is literally telling you, I have a weapon. And, I mean, we're talking seconds here, right, Fubar? Like, from the time, yeah. the first request to the time I he's shooting. I mean, literally, that happened probably in a 10-second span from when he requested the, uh, his driver's license to when he announced that firearm and shot him. You know, so it's a very, very quick situation. But it, it just, like, I don't... It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I think going back to the whole stand your ground law and stuff, I think that's a double-edged sword. Like, I want you to protect yourself and your property... But it literally, in that verbiage, it just says if your life is in, is threatened or you feel that your life is threatened, and that's why this officer got off on shooting and killing this person, because he felt like his life was endangered, that he was going to get shot, when obviously it wasn't. So I have a bunch of questions for you, knowing these cases that we just talked about. Now, you guys will notice that all five of these cases that we've talked about involve a person of color as the subject. Also... 
the officers in question in all of these cases are all different races. We have white, we have Asian, we have Hispanic. Um, I chose these cases for that reason because I have lots of questions for FUBAR, and I trust FUBAR so much because I know him from a long time. Him and I have been friends for a while now, at least four or five years, um, and I, I, I know a lot of the stuff that he deals with on the regular and by and large, police work, especially when you're out on the beat, so to speak, is very time-consuming, very tedious, very boring work most of the time. Um, but it's that, you know, that five minutes of your night when maybe it's a little chaotic and not quite so boring that can be the difference between survival and not. My first question to you, Fubar, would you ever be behind uh, com complete immunity for police officers? You're, you're talking about the qualified immunity? Right. Or in other words, um, in these situations where an officer might be not in the right, um, I mean, essentially immunity would say that they couldn't be charged with crimes in these, in these cases. And that's what, you know, we're all human beings, though. There's, there's always people that are doing wrong, whether it's a police officer or not a police officer. So that's why, you know, I... I do think that there should be some kind of qualified immunity, and that's why it goes to court and a grand jury and everybody decides on whether or not you get immunity. To have complete immunity, no way. I, you know, there are bad feeds out there and stuff. So it, it, to give, you know, the qualified immunity, I've seen a lot of cases where it goes against the officer and it goes for the officer. So I think that is a good system as of right now. Okay, so second question I have for you, because we did talk about the Tyreek Hill situation, where the officer in question, the guy that was in charge, was a 27-year veteran who had been suspended multiple times that we know of um, through the, the mainstream media. Um, so the question here is, um, uh, law enforcement work, in my opinion, cannot be like every other kind of work on the planet, where if you make a mistake, you just get to have a, a weekend off or a week off with no pay and then learn from your mistake. and Or I say that in air quotes, learn from your mistake and just go on. Because people's lives are at stake, not just your, you know, your life and your fellow officers, but the people that, the babies that you say that you're in charge of once they're detained. Um, at some point in time, like, that whole suspension thing has to stop, right? Like, these guys have to be held accountable before these things happen, right? Definitely. I mean, when I saw the report about that 27-year veteran, now, 20, 27 years is a long time, but multiple suspensions of 20-plus days, it's like, holy cow. Uh, I've never met, in my area, an officer that gets suspended for that long and isn't later fired. So how does he fall through the cracks with Miami Police Department of getting suspended multiple, multiple times, numerous days like that? Those are no small incidents. It's not like, hey, hey we got this citizen complaint that you called him a turd or something like that. We're going to suspend you 20 days. No, that's some serious suspension right there. So um, just, uh, just for uh, FYI's sake, every single officer that was in these cases, every single one of them had at least two. Um, prior punishments or disciplinary things that happened to them during their career. None of these officers that were uh, involved in these shootings were clean. All of them had disciplinary um, things on their record prior to these cases happening. That's pretty telling to me. That is pretty telling to me. Um, as a, as a, a, a longtime officer, FUBAR, how do you... What kind of changes would you make in the training protocol um, for for officers to ensure that they don't become what you call bad seeds? Um, so it's really improving here lately, and I think that some of these cases have brought it to light that we start doing this racial bias and implicit bias and de-escalation. We're, we're doing a lot more training on that than we ever did before but it starts at the academy because a lot of these academies they run like military boot camp and the military and the public is totally different you can't sit there and just drill somebody and turn them into this robot that's not what you want as an officer 
Oh, you need to start at the academy and change the academy. I'm going to go away with the boot, the boot camp military style and turn it into, you know, we're human beings and we got to treat each other like human beings. I think there should be a lot more sensitivity training too, don't you think? I, I guess, <laughs> uh, you know, it, that's why, I, you know, a lot of these veterans, like that 27-year veteran, like, when he got into copping, uh, you didn't have body cams and stuff like that. They took people out back and beat them to teach them a lesson. Now it's, we have a sensitive society and everything's on camera and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. it's like you you need to definitely treat people as human beings and treat everybody equal and treat them like, you know, we hold people responsible for their actions. So you, you tell them that, hey, I'm holding you responsible. I'm arresting you because you did X, Y, and Z. No, I'm not going to baby you, though. You're not going to play victim on me mm-hmm. and try and con me into feeling sorry for you and giving me, I'm going to give you the money out of my billfold and send you on your way when you just rob some old lady. Right. I'm Ultimately, not, that's not, not your job that. anyway. You're just, you're, you're, you're the vehicle to get those people into that, to the people who have that job. No, what I mean by sensitivity training yeah. is what you were saying, just humanizing yeah. people, right? Like understanding yeah. that you're dealing with another human being and, you know, maybe circumstances or whatever have put that person into a different situation than you as an officer are in. But I feel like what I mean by a lack of sensitivity training is just the dehumanization of subjects um, that these police officers are dealing with. Uh, I just feel like there has to be a better way um, to humanize people, whether they're, you know, active criminals or not. They are still human beings and they deserve not to go home in a body bag. Um, and it's not your job as an officer, and I, I'm pretty sure you'll agree with this, to be the judge and jury for somebody. You're just the vehicle. You're the delivery person. You're the Uber, so to speak, right? Yeah, and because, like, to me, uh, you know, I don't work in, you know, a big, like, Dallas or anything like that to where you're dealing with these not-so-good people 24-7. To me, it's like, whether you are a complete jerk to me or you're the nicest person, I'm still going to hold you accountable for your actions. So it's like, I treat you how you treat me. Now, if you're a jerk to me, I'm not going to sit here and play buddy with you. But also, it, you know, it's so it's like, you treat how you want to be treated. We learned that in kindergarten. Just treat others how you want to be treated. So mm-hmm. it's, it's not that hard as an officer. I get that you deal with the same people over and over again and you lose your patience and we're all human and you might lose those emotions, but that's where good qualities of an officer come in that you have to control those emotions. I agree. And the last situation I really want to talk about, and then I'll let you go. I know we're running late. Uh, this is really important stuff though. And I appreciate you being here for this Fubar, honestly. Um, so the last thing obviously is the racial aspect to this. Um, now, the statistics show that far more white people are are apprehended than colored people. This is a fact. There are, there are more white people that are apprehended in the United States than people of color. However, the far majority of officer-involved killings um, involve people of color. So even though white people are being arrested more, people of color are being shot more by officers. So the question for you as a career police officer, do you feel systemic racism is a problem within law enforcement in the United States? Yeah, and, and that uh, stems from society and stuff. I mean, it's that I can't remember the psychological or uh, scientific study that talks about the study where they put uh, a handgun in a in a black african-american male hand and then in a white per- or they show two pictures and they always put the negative one towards the african-american male but it's like yes there is that so you gotta you gotta tread lightly with that i mean it's it, again it, but it boils down to me of you know you just got to treat everybody as they're human beings i don't care what race you are what you know sexuality you are everybody's a human being we all want to be treated well And so how do we as a society make sure that the majority, not the majority, but every single officer has the same mindset that you just spoke of? Because that's not the case in this country. 
Not every officer has that mindset of, I'm going to treat this person the same regardless of what color they are or what orientation they are, whether I agree with their politics, whether I agree with their whatever. How do we get more officers like you? I mean, it, that just comes down to where, because like uh, here you have to go through the MMPI, which is the Minnesota Multiple, what, I don't even remember what it stands for, but it's a personality test. But to me, the second those red flags show up that this guy's a hothead or, you know, those red flags show up that this person isn't working out, you know, isn't treating people as human beings, and that's when you need to start disciplining them to either correct that behavior or put it on paper so you can end up firing them. Because to, like these multiple departments, like you said, where they had multiple write-ups and then it leads to this issue... Obviously, they probably shouldn't have been in policing. So, again, uh, there are studies. The statistics show that the mass majority of officer-involved killings involve officers that have had disciplinary things on their record. It's like less than 10% of the time where they're a complete clean record officer um, that just, you know, whatever, had a bad day or whatever you want to call it. Um, I feel like one of the things that um, could possibly help with this, and Fubar can agree or disagree or not even comment if he doesn't want to, but I feel like one of the things that, that deters us from systemic racism within law enforcement is accountability. And um, again, it's almost like a good old boy system. It's just like the military where, you know, you have cliques and you have people that get along and um, are going to make sure that they, uh, you know, that nobody gets in trouble or whatever and won't say anything if they see something. Um, and a lot of um, um, departments, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, I've never been a cop, but a lot of departments make it so that if, um, uh, if an officer wants to make a report on another officer, the officer that's getting reported has a right to know who the name is of the person that's reporting them. And I think as long as that's a thing, I think officers are going to be afraid to hold another officer accountable um, because then, you know, their career advancement could be in jeopardy. And I think that's a big portion of this um, is, you know, these guys and girls are doing things that they shouldn't be doing and others are seeing it that might be, you know, lesser on the chain of command that won't say anything because their name will be publicized that they reported the person above them. And I think there should be a way to um, anonymously report another officer for bad behavior. Um, and perhaps that accountability would become more of a thing. I don't know. What do you all think? I yeah, it's definitely true. Go ahead. Oh, well, I just, I know I've been quiet, but I've been, I've been taking it all in. I, uh, I agree with everything that's been said. I haven't had any interjections or anything. I'm, I'm enjoying this. I like, I like debates. I like, uh, I like yeah, it's shit. very, it's Fubar. very, um, enlightening for sure. What do you think about the accountability issue, Fubar? So if you go to some of these really big departments, like the New York, uh, New York city police department and some of these really big, they are very, like, they're almost a gang themselves. I agree. And so that's where that, that corruption begins because then it's That can like, happen in small towns, too, brother. where these guys have known each other for 50 well, yeah. years, too, right? So. Yep, yep. It's more prevalent in the big cities, but it's definitely, it happens in the small ones, too, of, you know, when you're in the police work, I mean, you even see it in, like, fire departments and stuff, you get into this brotherhood and... Nobody wants to snitch on it. You know, you, you got to keep everything good. Just brush it under the rug. No, that's wrong is wrong. Right is right. Wrong is wrong. Uh, that's simple as it is. Now, they've kind of cleaned that up a little bit more of internal affairs and county attorneys and stuff. You can report them that way and stuff. So it's, it's definitely a little bit more cleaned up, but it's still not a good perfect system there's a lot of work to do for sure in this situation and unfortunately too many people are dying of all races and all orientations of all colors and creeds and um and at the end of the day we are all human um whether you're Ty tyree kill who's late for a game and probably shouldn't be speeding and um maybe you know maybe you shouldn't be rolling your tinted windows down and um but, you know, and then maybe that officer's having a bad day and doesn't want to deal with the shit today. And, you know, 
maybe he's missing his son's ball game or whatever it is. We all have circumstances that we're dealing with every day. Um, and we don't know how much of those human elements are entering these situations. But the cases that I've shown today, I feel like race had a lot to do with a lot of these situations. The reason why I wanted to show it the way we did today, again, is because we had Hispanic cops. Asian cops were involved with the George Floyd thing. Um, uh, Hispanic cops were in the Tyreek Hill case and the Philando Castile case. We had white police officers that were part of the George Floyd stuff, the Breonna Taylor one and the Rayshard Brooks one. And so you can say systemic racism is always white versus black, and I disagree. I think it's all races. I think it's a problem that's in this country. I think that when people are brought up within not just their own traditions, but also within the training of being a police officer, I believe that we are trained or, or almost indoctrinated to see a certain color and then automatically make assumptions based on their race, on who and what they are. Um, you hear the word thug a lot. You know, to describe people of color, which I think is absolutely disgusting. Um, I think everybody uh, has has a tendency to be bad, and everybody has a tendency to be good, and it's impossible to know which you are just by seeing somebody on the surface. Nobody will know. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's too late by the time you find out, and that's the scary part about being an officer. Fubar, thank you so much for being here, man. Um, just a, a killer Thanks idea. And I'm glad you were able to, to make it. And I'm going to let you go to work. I know you're an hour late. So get the hell out of here, bro. All right. <laughs> we'll see you guys. Yeah, you have a good me. night, brother. Thank you so much for being on. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Man, what an interesting conversation. Again, um, Fubar came to me I with know, this. I know, I'm enjoying it. Uh, he came to me with this uh, earlier in the week, and I had not thought of who my special guest was going to be this week yet. Um, and he came with me with this idea because of the Tyreek Hill stuff. And honestly, because you and I don't talk sports, Katie, uh, that wasn't going to make the show, obviously. It was really more sports related right but i thought yeah. this would be fabulous for both of us to to talk about this is a huge issue in our country absolutely um, and i feel bad i didn't talk that much but god y'all were on it and i was like i feel like i was just a viewer on the show just... and none of that was planned i have to tell you like i told fubar don't tell me any of no, your I like i told yeah. him don't tell me your opinions on this shit but I, I had a list of cases that had bothered me over the years that I already knew when he came to me with the idea I want to do. And I had no idea how he felt about any of them and how he would feel about, you know, whether they were right, wrong, indifferent, whatever. So it was really interesting to go into this completely blind. Um, yeah. But, he, yeah, he did awesome. Fubar is an awesome guy. He he's, uh, he's been a viewer and friend for so long. Um, so it's so good to have him on. So what do you have awesome. planned uh, for the rest of the week? You still doing, uh, I imagine you're still doing wedding stuff, right? Yes. So, um, God, I don't know what I'm doing this week. Uh, what's the day? Oh, Saturday is that uh, random show that I didn't have that I now have um, on the 21st. The one that I was booked for without my knowledge. Um <laughs> And then, um, I don't really have that much. I'm working some, but um, next Saturday, the 28th, we are going to find my mom something to wear. Mm. We're dedicating a day to it. Because, That's awesome. Well, yes, but <laughs> she's insane. Well, if she hears this, she will agree. She's so, she wants this, but ooh, I want this. And she thinks she looks awful in anything, and she's very, very picky. Yep. Very, it's going to be an all-day thing. And she's like, I already know. She was like, I'm not going to find nothing. I already know I ain't going to find nothing. Just try to have fun and, you know, be there for her. Because I know, you know, your dad not being here, and I know we just, uh, we went through the one year yeah. for that. So, um, I was giving you virtual hugs that day. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I miss them, too, just so you know. Um, but your mom's going to yeah. need, especially you, I think, um, to be there. Oh, for sure. You know, 
Um, but yeah, we're going to end episode 20 right here. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Um, if you are watching on YouTube, Spotify, wherever you are, hit the like button, um, follow, subscribe, do all of the free things. Um, if you would like, wow, Katie, you are popping off over there. <laughs> Um, if you guys would like to sponsor an episode, let me know. We are at the Chris and Katie Show at gmail.com. And um, yeah, we will catch you down the road.